All right, hello everyone and happy new year. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, the, we the Edge User Group Monthly Update, the January 2021 edition. Just a couple of housekeeping items while everybody gets settled. We are using the Zoom webinar platform for today's webinar, so your mics and cameras are disabled by default. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat function and select all panelists and we will work with you directly to sort it out. If at any time during the webinar you have questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. Please note that we will hold all questions until after the presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to ACRO's Deputy Director, Melanie Gottlieb. Thank you so much, Anetta. Good afternoon. I am Melanie Gottlieb, Deputy Director of ACRO, and I would like to welcome you to our first EDGE user group of 2021. We know how busy we, you all are, and so we thank you for joining us. As always, we are hopeful that our technology will not fail us. This is a fairly large Zoom call. Um, people are still filing in. Um, and we at ACRO, like many of you, remain at home at the mercies of our home Wi-Fi. You can go ahead and use the chat freely while on the webinar and speak to each other or, uh, or pose a questions. And as Annetta indicated, we will hold questions until the Q&A section at the end. If your question is for a specific panelist, please indicate which panelist uh, that, uh, that question is for. Um, I also, as we are still filing in, would like to get a sense of who is joining us today. I'm gonna launch a poll to find out who, who's here. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. And it asks, what segment of the population do you represent? Are you institution-based staff? Are you evaluation service staff? Are you with the government? Or are you with a law firm? And second, asking, is this your first user group? Or are you a repeat user group uh, participant? And we're going to just give that a couple, maybe about 15 more seconds. Uh, it looks like most people have gone ahead and answered the poll. And I am going to, I'm going to go ahead and close it and I'm going to share the results. And it looks like most of you are institutional staff. So welcome. Uh, we hope that uh, you're getting ready for your students to return. And it looks like we are few, about 50-50 almost uh, in terms of repeat uh, user group members. So thank you for that. And I am now going to introduce Jasmine Saidi kunert um, She is the chair of the IESC and she is also founder and president and CEO of ACEI. Jasmine. Thank you, Melanie, and hello, everybody, and Happy New Year. It's a pleasure to be with you here again uh, at the beginning of this year uh, for our Edge User Guide webinars. For those of you who are new to this uh, webinar, uh, I serve as chair of the International Education Standards Council, which is the IESC. And this is the body that oversees the country profiles and the credential advice that you find in the EDGE database. Joining me today on the panel are three of my colleagues who serve on the IESC. We have with us Nancy Katz, who's the Director of the Evaluation Services in Chicago. We have Emily Say, who's also Director of Evaluations at IERF in California. And we also have Robert Watkins from University of Texas, Austin. And on the screen, you will see additional members of our council, but uh, who will not be joining us today, but they may be listening in. Um, but these are the, the wonderful people that I have the honor and pleasure of working with um, for the EDGE database. The IESC, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a volunteer um, assembly of experienced professionals who are familiar with credential evaluations and international admissions. Uh, our members uh, are either uh, 
uh, working at US higher education institutions as well as private credential evaluation services. We have each authored country profiles and have been part of uh, several research projects that have culminated in publications that have been sponsored by ACRO and NAFSA. So you can be confident that the recommendations that are presented in the uh, EDGE uh, database are carefully vetted, discussed, and discussed even more amongst us, and they represent the varied viewpoints held within higher education. This also applies to the grading scales and the cre uh, credential advice that you will refer to in, in, in EDGE. We, uh, we meet twice a month, and uh, this is uh, the opportunity we get to actually flesh out some of the credential questions that come to us. We also discuss these issues on a regular basis via email. And how we address uh, topics that are presented to us typically come to us by EDGE subscribers who encounter a credential they may not find in the database or may find uh, up-to-date information that we require to, uh, that they submit to us that we require to review and consider to update and refresh the information on the countries. So we really value the EDGE users uh, for your input and we appreciate your uh, submissions of new documents. So feel free to send uh, these queries to the um, EDGE email address that you have and uh, it will always come to our attention. Today we have put together on the agenda a number of um, issues that we are tackling. Some of them have been completed, some of them are works in progress. And my colleagues and I will touch on those countries uh, uh, in the upcoming slides. So as you can see, we on the slide we have right now, these are the, the country profiles on research updates. Uh, these, we had already addressed these in our past a webinar, but we'd like to bring this to your attention in case you missed it. We have a number of white papers that are now available for your review. There's the Cuba Project uh, white paper that's available. The country profile for EDGE has been completed. It's currently under review. This is the section where particularly the credential advice that has to be uh, reviewed and voted on by the members. The Cuba country profile for EDGE also has been completed uh, under review. And one of the big projects that we have completed is prepared by the IESC fellows. And you will learn more about this uh, fellowship program uh, uh, as the webinar progresses by Melanie, but our fellows have been assigned a project and it has to do with the offshore medical schools in the Caribbean. And they're put together a comprehensive list of uh, these institutions and their accreditation status. And we look forward to uh, releasing this information to you in the coming weeks. Um, so this is it from uh, the kind of the big projects that uh, IESC has been engaged in. Um, and I guess the next step would be to look into the countries that we will be discussing with you today. So we have Ireland, Thailand, uh, Republic of Korea, Mexico, and Spain. And the first country, Ireland, has to deal with the secondary grading scale. And my colleague, Emily, say will be offering you the update on this. Emily? Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you may be. So one query that our group recently re excuse me, recently received was about the new grading scale for the Irish Leaving Certificate. Now the Leaving Certificate represents a set of exams that are taken at the national level at the conclusion of the secondary education cycle and which is required for entry into higher education. And what happens is that the universities uh, together with the uh, Department of Education and Skills looked at how the transition between secondary education and higher education can be improved. And one of the things that they looked at was the assessment scheme. Uh, next, scale, next slide, please. So previously, uh, prior to 2017, uh, as you can see here in the chart, it was a 14 point grading scale. So they had A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then for certain of those letter grades, they were further divided into subcategories. So A was further split into A1 and A2. B was further split into B1, B2, and B3, so on and so forth. 
And it was determined that these uh, micro levels, uh, if you will, weren't necessarily meaningful to the higher education institutions in terms of looking at a student's achievements and their abilities. And they felt that it didn't do much for the learner experience either. So they decided that in 2017, they would introduce a new grading scale um, and it became an eight point grading scale instead from one through eight. Uh, one being the highest and eight being the lowest. Now, if you see an H before it, it's referring to the higher subjects. And if you see an O before it, um, it's referring to the ordinary subjects. Now on the leaving certificate examinations, uh, at minimum five subjects are required. Um, most uh, take uh, six to seven subjects and universities like to see among those subjects a minimum of, of two higher subjects. And as the name would suggest, uh, higher subjects are those that are studied at a more in-depth level. Uh, on to the next slide, please. So you have H1 through H8 and O1 through O8. And the uh, percentage ranges uh, they represent are the same. So for example, H1 and O1 are both 90 to 100. H2 and O2 are both 80 to 90, so on and so forth. Um, but there are slight differences in terms of the lowest passing grade for the higher subjects and then the ordinary subjects. So it will depend on the level. Uh, the O6 uh, represents the lowest passing grade. So we have from O1 through O6, uh, and we converted it to the US equivalent of A plus A, B plus B, C plus C accordingly. And O7 and O8 are failing grades. So this is what was uh, subsequently placed uh, in the EDGE database for Ireland. Um, now the higher level subjects, um, the, again, the percentage ranges are the same, but H7 uh, is still passing for the higher subjects. If, when we looked at the ordinary level subjects, O6 was the lowest passing, but for higher, it's H7. So now you'll see with H7 being a D grade instead uh, for the US educational equivalent. And those are the grading scales and the Irish Leaving Certificate for you. On to Nancy. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the grading scales from Thailand. An, an edge user had a question about why we didn't have US equivalencies for Thailand, which we actually were surprised as well. Um, however, we did do, as we always do, is we research what the question is to make sure that it's not an error or um, just to rectify and put the correct information out. And a uh, next slide, please, Drew. Um, and the question was on the secondary school system as well as post secondary. This slide now has indicated the second, the US equivalency grades. If you do have the ACRO NAFSA book on Thailand from 2000, which is in the ACRO, which is in the EDGE database from 2000, this corresponds to the grading scale recommended by the authors on page eight for the secondary school education. Next slide. We also did, did not have the US equivalency grades for post-secondary education. This is an abbreviated correction of the website on the EDGE website for Thailand. This is also listed on page 41 of the 2000 book on Thailand. But if you also go into the EDGE database, it does give a little bit more detailed information for a number of schools, which are very few, like three to five schools that do indeed have a different grading scale. Thailand does follow the US grading scale, as you can see with the grades corresponding uh, numeric grades and then the suggested US grading. This has been corrected in EDGE and um, you can feel free to review it at your leisure. Uh, I think we're- me. Nancy, this is Jasmine. Yes. If we could just go back to that slide. I do see a typo, I think on the indigenous letter grade. This is just for our audience. Uh, it should be Correct. after C, D plus D. Correct. I Thank now you. I now see I that. just saw this. <laughs> and the same thing on the uh, US equivalency. Drew, who is our taskmaster and 
does all these great corrections for us. If you can make sure that you make that correction, that would be great. I will tell Thank you, you in the book, it is correct on page 41 in the book on Thailand from 2000. There are two books there for Thailand, 1978. And, that, and 2000, 2000 is the most up-to-date book that we have. Uh, next slide and next speaker, speaker for South Korea. Yes, thank you, Nancy. Um, this is Robert Watkins. Uh, I'm going to talk, chat a bit about the next two. First, we have Korea. Um, and Drew, if you can go to the next, there you go, thanks. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that's, um, that's something of a theme today is, is thank you edge users. <laughs> and that's really true because um, this too was brought to our attention by an edge user. Um, the other thing that, that, that I think we've mentioned in the past at these user webinars is that edge rolled out 15 years ago or so uh, in rather hasty fashion. There was some pressure to get this out there and get it done. At the time we thought perhaps we could maybe make this really quick by being uh, something of a minimalist on some of the approaches to credentials that we could say in the case of Korea, for example, where the first degree at the university is a bachelor's degree, very much like the US educational system, we could just simply have a generic bachelor's entry and that would cover all bases. Well, you guys need more than that. Uh, and it makes total sense to have more credentials in there. So when this was brought to our attention, we got on it. It was a surprise, something of a surprise to us that there was no um, pharmacy degree mentioned by itself uh, in Edge Korea. And so we, we quickly added that in there. And as you can see, the description is following four years of university study. Um, then the advice is that it's, the, it's comparable to a bachelor's degree in the United States. And then we have an author's note. And this is important because those of you that have been doing this for a while would probably look at the credential advice and say, now, wait a minute. Um, isn't the advice supposed to uh, represent what the equivalency would be, uh, the comparability in the United States? And as we all know, um, there are no more bachelor's degrees in pharmacy. I must say, add that there were when I started in the field many, many, many years ago, but there aren't none anymore. Not Certainly not a practicing first degree in pharmacy that allows for professional practice. And so we had to be careful as we did this because the, the practicing degree in pharmacy in the United States now is the PharmD. UT Austin, for example, has a, a great school of pharmacy with one of the earliest uh, PharmD programs uh, in the country. And so we, we had to be careful that we couldn't give this an, uh, the result of first professional degree in pharmacy, even though it is in Korea, because there is no bachelor of pharmacy in, in the United States. There might be some pharmaceutical uh, studies out there, Bachelor of Pharmaceutical Studies or Pharmaceutical Sciences, but there is no B Farm anymore. So what we decided was to have the generic response be bachelor's degree because that's what we wanted you edge users to see this as, a bachelor's degree. And then in the note, get, bring you up to speed on the fact that it, it actually acts like what you might see today as the PharmD in most US institutions. As you can see, it is a, an entry level degree, a first degree, because the high school diploma is what's needed to get in um, to the program. Um, so now it's in there. Um, and we used as a model for this, um, a similar kind of problem we had in the Philippines, the Bachelor of Physical Therapy. There's still a Bachelor of Physical Therapy in Philippines, but no longer in the United States. So that pr proved to be something of a precedent and template for us to use uh, for dealing with this one. And now uh, let's move on to, yeah, thank you, Mexico. And here, as most of you know, um, technical education alongside academic education exists all over the world. And particularly in Central and South America, you see um, technician uh, titles that are um, available to students for cho uh, to choose as they exit the academic track or move over from the academic track into a technical track because they're not looking necessarily toward um, higher education or university education for sure, but rather 
um, the employment sector or, some, or perhaps some additional higher technical education. In any case, in Mexico, um, which is a little more developed than Korea because we get a lot more um, Mexican students and um, also um, professionals coming in to the credential services uh, than in other countries. And so it was a surprise to us when an edge user <laughs> wrote in and said, there's no um, post-secondary level uh, technical entry in Mexico. And sure enough, they're right. We have one, uh, interestingly enough, for the, um, for the middle school uh, diploma, the uh, Tecnico Nivel Medio. Um, we have the one for the high school, which is simply called Titulo de Tecnico. Um, but we didn't have one at the higher level. And so we had to insert this. And as you can see, um, it's a higher technician title uh, done at uh, technological universities, Universidad Tecnología, and um, it's about two or three. Now, in my experience, most of the time it's two, but it's not invariably two. Um, so it's definitely less than the standard um, first degree by universities in Mexico, the licenciado, or the titulo de name of the field, like ingeniero, engineer, uh, abogado, uh, lawyer, and so forth, um, but it, it will have that title, Technico Superior, and that's important because that means it's higher than that Technico that's at a high school level for which only a ninth grade education is needed to enter the program. Here you have to have the Bachillerato, as you can see, the Bachillerato, or more often Bachillerato Technico, and then it's two years beyond that. So you would be considering giving uh, the, the two or the three years of credit um, that whatever, however long the program uh, lasts when you uh, look at it for a course by course evaluation. And with that, I'm going to conclude. And now we want to move on to, thank you, Spain. And I believe um, that is Jasmine. Yes, thank you, Robert. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, this credential, which is entitled Titulo de Tecnico Superior, uh, was received by my company uh, for evaluation. And uh, what I like to do always is when I see something that uh, we don't find in our archives was to also refer to the EDGE database on Spain and found that this credential was not listed. As you can see, uh, the circle section, that's the title of the diploma. Uh, on the left hand side of your screen, the, the language is Basque and on the right hand it's uh, Spanish and the diploma does bear the, uh, the name of the, the King of Spain, which uh, makes this an official uh, uh, credential. Uh, so the question we had was, is this a uh, secondary level, an upper secondary or a post-secondary credential? Our applicant had presented to us proof of having completed a vocational upper secondary program. And uh, then subsequent to that, they studied two years after which they received this uh, titulo de tecnico superior. May, may we move to the next slide, please? And so what we have done, this is still a credential in progress. It has not yet been voted by, uh, by the IESC. So it hasn't yet been uh, uploaded to the EDGE Spain country profile. But this is kind of to help you understand how we gather information and how we present it. So this is something that we will be reviewing based on the research that uh, I will uh, offer to the IESC. What we have found now is that the duration of the program is in fact two years. It does require for admission completion of upper secondary vocational cycle, which is known as a grado medio de formación profesional. And uh, the research that we did led us to a document called the uh, Boletín Oficial del Estado. And this is the official bulletin of studies issued by the Spanish uh, Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sports. Uh, <clears throat> and I found this via the NUFIC, which is the Dutch uh, nonprofit organization that is in, uh, involved in international education. Well, and the link is in this, uh, on this slide. So through there, I went to the ministry's uh, bulletin 
and found that this particular credential is classified with the other post-secondary university level documents, meaning uh, the Titulo Tecnico is a first level credential, then after that is an undergraduate degree, then a master, uh, master's degree and a doctorate degree. So it was not, uh, the ministry does not classify this as a non uh, post-secondary uh, credential or some uh, sort of ancillary uh, qualification. So the recommendation that I'm presenting to the members of the council is to recognize this two-year program uh, as a two-year post-secondary with credit to be awarded on a course-by-course -course basis. But I just wanted to share with you a sample of a document that we have, we have received uh, we're reviewing, we've done the research and how we present it to the ISC. So um, in our next meeting, this is a subject for our, my colleagues to review and vote on. And once it's approved, then you will find this content uploaded onto uh, the country profile for Spain under credential advice. Thank you. And uh, in addition to adding in those new grading scales and adding in those new credentials, um, another thing that's been recently added into EDGE is some information on how to use some of the new tools. Uh, last year in July, uh, we did switch over to our new format, it's EDGE 3.0, uh, and there are a bunch of new features. There's a new credential search feature, there are bookmarks that you can use to keep track of substantive updates, meaning updates to credentials or new advice or new grading skills that have gotten added in there. Um, and with those bookmarks, you're notified when you log in of any changes that have happened since the last time you logged in. We put together a series of videos so that you can have a better understanding of how to best use those new features. Um, you can see those here. Uh, one of the big ones that people like to reach out and ask about is how to find the recognition status of a particular institution. We've even put together a video to give you some suggestions on best practices there. Um, one of the things that is also new is there's a brand new interface for how you're going to, to access and uh, log in and make changes and edits to, to who at your um, institution or at your uh, evaluation agency or at your law firm, um, who has access to the information within EDGE. And so we put together kind of a how-to video there as well. You can check out more of that at acro.org slash edge slash user guide. We've also got some frequently asked questions on another page that you may want to take a look at as well. And Thanks with that, so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, Drew. I appreciate it. And, and I will say um, I was I forgot to introduce Drew at the beginning of the webinar. And so uh, Drew Carlisle, um, who was just sharing the edge, uh, the, the new video features, the user guide videos. Um, and Drew is the person, if you email Edge, 99% of the time, Drew is the person who is going to be answering that question. Um, he makes it all work behind the scenes. And so we're very appreciative of that. So now we're going to move into the Q&A section. Um, I would ask that anyone who has a question, if they could pop it into the Q&A section of the webinar, which you should be able to see um, in the bottom of your screen, and if, it's, if that question is for a specific panelist, please um, indicate that. Otherwise, I will share it with all panelists and assign it to someone. I will start. There is one question to begin with already. Um, and this one I suspect is going to be for Robert because it's about the bee farm in Korea. Since the Bachelor of Pharmacy Science in Korea would only be considered a bachelor's level, is there a separate qualification in South Korea that would be considered equivalent to a first professional degree in pharmacy or a PharmD? Or is the argument that if we have both the Korean Bachelor of Pharmacy Science plus licensure from a candidate, that that combination would be comparable to a PharmD? Thoughts on that, Robert, or anything? Sure, um, I'll be glad to. Um, First of all, we need to understand that the bachelor, the, the credential that, that we presented today or that's now been added to EDGE is in fact the first professional degree in pharmacy still in Korea. And that's what we mean in our note. That's what we hope we were trying to make. If we weren't clear on that, we, you know, we welcome um, suggestions on wording that would make it clearer. But that was our attempt to say 
treat this as a bachelor's degree in a, in a, in a, in a general sense. And by the way, you should know <clears throat> that in fact, the, um, this degree does enable the holder to, to practice pharmacy in Korea. Now, given that the Korean educational system is so very much similar to the US educational system, it's only inevitable, it seems to me, that um, sooner or later we're going to see something like the PharmD in Korea. In fact, it may even be out there. Some of you may have even seen one. We have not gone systematically back through Korean universities looking for these. Um, but if they come up, we naturally want to address it. But there, as far as I know, there is not yet a PharmD out there. So the Bachelor of Pharmacy is the one um, that, that you would look to as the one now, as the one that's comparable to our PharmD in a functional sense. And let me emphasize functional sense. It's not a doctor degree. It's not a professional doctorate. It's a bachelor's degree. And the reason we wanted, once again, to keep it as the bachelor's degree uh, in our credential advice is because this system is so much like the US educational system that we can really start to confuse people if we depart from what it is, a bachelor's degree, all right? We once had one, but we don't anymore. So we shied away from, from giving it the credential advice of H. One of the reasons, or I'm sorry, of uh, first professional degree in pharmacy. One of the reasons for that is, is that one of the frequent questions that comes up whenever somebody, an edge user comes across that um, credential advice, first professional degree in medicine, dentistry, vet med, whatever, um, there's the inevitable question if you're an institution like mine, that is, well, is it a bachelor's, is it a master's, what is it? Uh, can I admit them into my graduate school? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> so that's why we wanted to stick with the bachelor advice, but we also wanted you to know, hey, guess what? This bachelor's degree in Korea will also still, unlike in the United States today, will still allow one to become a, phar a professional pharmacist. Let me, one last thing on licensing. Um, Licensing is, is something that certainly takes place in the United States. You don't get to practice your professional degree that was awarded to you by say the University of Texas um, just because you got the degree. That's not the case in the United States. It is the case in much of the rest of the world. And so we shy away from getting into the licensing piece because even though that's done here, that's not necessarily done out there. Certainly there are exceptions. Philippines comes immediately to mind, but we didn't want to confuse the issue by throwing the licensing piece in there. Thanks, Robert. All right, a few more questions. Um, here's a question about Latin America. It says, we often see different diplomados after completion of a BA. Would you consider them equivalent to graduate coursework? And if so, is there a minimum length for them to be considered graduate equivalency? Anyone? Melanie, I, I'll be happy to answer that. This is Jasmine. Um, good question. Uh, I think that as a rule, uh, we should always have the, the following uh, tips in, in our back pocket. Always find what the minimum requirement for admission is to the program that you're evaluating. So if you are in possession of a diploma, even though you may have a credential prior to that, that you have deemed to be comparable to a bachelor's degree for the diploma, make sure that the entrance criteria is that first degree. If you find that the entrance criteria is less than the first degree, for example, it may require completion of upper secondary education, senior high school, then that program will not be considered comparable to a graduate level uh, uh, credential. Uh, but if it is determined that to be admitted to that diploma program, the individual must have completed the first university degree that is comparable to our first undergraduate university degree of a bachelor, then you can look at that as uh, you know, a graduate program. But the next thing is, does the institution look at this as a program that is advanced above that first uh, level degree? Or is it maybe something that is a continuation, something such as um, a professional development or so it's an enhancement of the undergraduate? 
if it's a program that they consider that part of it can be applied to their second university degree, that is a master's degree, then you can be certain that you're dealing with something that we will comfortably look at as a graduate level credential. In terms of the number of credits, the next step would be to look at the duration of the program. Is this a short-term program? Does this require at least you know, three to four months of full-time attendance? Then you can look at that as comparable to a semester uh, system. Look at the credits or the hours of instruction, whether there was lecture or theory, uh, uh, laboratory or practice, that would help you determine the number of credits. But uh, don't arbitrarily look at them as being graduate level and don't arbitrarily grant credit unless you have those um, uh, check, uh, those items, you know, those tips checked on from your list and then you can comfortably move forward uh, with assessing that. Thanks so much, Jasmine. You're Here's welcome. another question. Um, what are the guidelines for institutions accredited by other ministries, not the education ministry? For example, China and the Air Force Engineering University is accredited by the Ministry of National Defense. Could a bachelor's degree uh, earned by that um, from this institution be evaluated as another bachelor's earned at a university accredited by the MOE in China. Who would like to take that question? I'll, I'll jump on that one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's, there's no question, but that what we're concerned about is recognition by the government, okay? So when we have another ministry other than the Ministry of Education, then that should be sufficient for us. And the reason for that is that depending on what that school specializes in, and often it is very specialized in nature, the, the ministry where that, um, that field or discipline most often lives or is, or is governed um, is where it's going to end up residing. For example, the, the one that's raised here by the questioner, um, Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of Defense and not just in China, it, it happens in other countries as well. The Ministry of Defense likes to um, completely, I don't know how to put this diplomatically, but loves to control completely what's going on at its service academies. The prime exception is of course the United States where our service academies have to meet the, the, the accreditation procedures that any academic institution has to follow. But in other countries, that's not the case. The ministry wants to control it because it wants to control the curriculum. It wants to control um, the budget. And sometimes that budget may be partially secret. Um, and all the things that an MOE, Ministry of Education, um, overs uh, 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 oversight would entail, the, the, the Ministry of National Defense doesn't want to have involved. And so there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a question of control. Ministry of Health often wants to be on top of guidelines for education for uh, healthcare professionals in that country and so forth. So my response to you is, is that's perfectly fine. The government is the government is the government, all right? And so that, that would be my response to that, uh, not just for China, but for um, other countries as well. And those of you that like to use the World Higher Education Database, let me point out that not only is it one, a secondary source, not a primary source, but two, purports to offer up to you um, the schools that are recognized by the Ministry of Education and only certain kinds of institutions, full-blown degree granting institutions, generally speaking. So that's gonna leave out a lot of recognized institutions. For example, the ones recognized by the Ministry of Defense in China. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, Melanie. Thanks so much, Robert. I appreciate it. Um, I've got a couple of questions that um, either I or Drew or some of, of uh, some of the other folks might want to answer that are just more around process. Um, there is a question about Edge adding a GPA calculator. Um, I will say that at the moment, a GPA calculator is not 
in the, the, the most current rounds of what we're looking at for edge updates, but it's certainly something on the list that we could explore at some point. So um, I see a couple of people gave that an up thumb. And so um, we'll add it to our list uh, for consideration for future development. Um, there's a question about uh, updates on the French educational system. How soon can we expect an update? I'll tell you that the French educational system has been updating itself for the last decade. It's a constant, constant um, educational um, update mode within the country itself. Um, we do have a meeting actually next week uh, with someone um, from the French ministry and we are always looking to update. So if there is something that you see that we are specifically missing, I hope that you will submit a comment or submit an update and just let us know that, hey, you're missing X, Y, or Z. Um, but know that um, France in particular is challenging because it feels a little bit like a moving target. They've just been changing things a lot. Um, and we do have uh, meetings coming up looking at that. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything about either of those two issues. Um, there's also a question that I'm gonna punt over to Drew. Uh, about are credentials supposed to be listed in chronological order? I noticed under Columbia, for example, the bachelor's degree was listed after the professional degrees. Drew, do you wanna talk a little bit about searching for credentials and credential order? Yeah, absolutely, Melanie. So in the new edge, um, if, if, if any of you were users of the previous version, uh, you'll recall that there were uh, about <clears throat> 10 credentials listed on each page and you would, you would tick through when you needed to, to find a new credential. Um, for anyone that is unfamiliar, that's not intimately familiar with an education system, it may have been difficult to figure out precisely where that credential was going to find chronologically. So in the new system, it's all in one list that you would be able to search through. And there's actually a new credential search feature that you can use. You can type part of the name or the full name of the credential using the appropriate accents, of course. Um, and that would actually shorten your list significantly uh, right down to uh, just a couple of options for you. Now, even within uh, a given level, um, it is, it is going to um, alphabetize some of those credentials. So it's not designed to be chronological anymore. It's designed to be easier for you to find that specific credential that you have in front of you. After listening uh, with, some, uh, with some other user groups that we've, that we've held, uh, what we found was more than um, people needing it to be in chronological order, they needed to be able to find that specific credential. That was the intention there. And uh, you would still be able to, if you know the name of the credential that you're looking for, find it very simply. With that new secondary credential search feature, when you're in that credential section, there's a main search feature at the top of Edge that'll globally search the entire website, the entire database. But when you look down just a little bit lower, you'll see that there is another search feature and that's where you wanna type in the name of the credential you're searching for. Thanks so much, Drew. And I would just add that if you want to have a good sense of the order in which credentials um, are, are sequenced uh, within the system, the best place to do that is to take a look at the ladder. Um, we know that uh, students tend to have fall into educational pathways. And we also know that more and more those, those traditional educational pathways don't flow as smoothly as they were initially intended. And so um, it's always good to not only look at the credential, but also to take a look at the ladder so you have an understanding of where that credential falls in the system and where it should be sequenced within the system. All right. Um, I do have some notes here. How about, um, let me look at the time. We do have a time for just a little bit more. Um, anyone on the call ever see an Indonesian diploma, an SPD, and do they know, is it equivalent to a Bachelor of Education? And does it make the student eligible for graduate study? The questioner, 
did spell it out and I will read it, but it, I will probably butcher it because I don't speak Indonesian. Uh, it looks like Sarjana Pendidekin, Pendidekin or SPD. Anyone ever see that credential? Uh, Melanie, yeah, I, I don't know that I've seen it lately, but um, <clears throat> the the Sarjana, of course, is the first is a first university or higher education diploma degree uh, awarded in Indonesia. The problem with that is that it can be three years or four years. Um, the Sarjana Muda is definitely a three year degree, um, and so historically has not been admitted for it's certainly not bachelor's equivalent. So therefore, most of us don't admit to graduate study, doesn't get a bachelor's comparability from credential services and so forth. The Sarjana, however, um, is a four year degree. And that's the one that we all look to as being comparable to the US bachelor's degree. Off the top of my head, hopefully somebody else is scrolling through Indonesia as I speak, but um, the education degree I can't remember if it's three or four. It's possible that it comes in both versions. If so, obviously we would favor the four versus the, the three. What Indonesia began to um, move toward at the turn of the century and beyond was the, to sort of get away from the, the actual words Sarjana and go to um, uh, the, the term S1, uh, which means uh, that it's the first degree and then an S2 or something to, along those lines, sort of a strata. In fact, uh, they also would say Sarjana strata and then they would give the number. Um, so uh, again, I would just say that as far as the education degree, I can't recall if it's three or four uh, or maybe it's both, but I would definitely um, look to the four year version, four year full time, as the one that would be comparable to our own Bachelor of Education. Thank you, Robert, I appreciate that. Um, let's see, I have, here's a, here's a good general question. I've just received two Benue State University uh, located in Makurdi, Nigeria, where the students' names are listed middle name, first name, last name. Is that normal? Can anyone comment on that? This is Jasmine. Um, these, these things do happen. Um, I'm not going to, uh, what we end up doing is we, we do com uh, contact the institution to verify, um, but these sorts of errors sometimes do happen. They're just human errors because some of these uh, systems have not been automated the way we're familiar with them. So if, if you have the slightest doubt about a credential, your best uh, uh, mode of action is to contact the, the source institution. At the slightest doubt, contact the source institution for verification. And another resource that is available to everyone within EDGE, um, on, on each page, we've included a link where you can uh, join our, our listserv, the International Activities Listserv. And the folks that are, uh, that are participating on there, it's everyone, uh, it's, it's ACRO employees, it's your colleagues in admissions offices. Uh, it, it's, it's lots of folks that have some background in international education and experience there. And, I don't know what, what y'all find, but I think that there's a lot of uh, desire to be collaborative in this industry. And uh, we use that as a way that you can reach out and connect with your colleagues directly just by sending that one single email. If you're not already signed up for that free listserv, you can find it on any page with an edge, scroll down uh, about close to the bottom. It says, uh, join our listserv. Um, that's another place that you might reach out and find that answer that you're looking for. Great, thank you, Drew. Um, we have time for just a little bit more. Um, I have a, this is an interesting question. We didn't talk about India really in this particular, um, it, this particular um, user group, but there's a question for an Indian, for an India SME. Have, have we had any updates on how to access the new DigiLocker wallet to access official documents? 
So I know that that's not something that we have uh, had a ton of experience with yet because it's new, but I'll ask our colleagues if any of them have had experience yet. And it's certainly something that we are paying close attention to here at ACRO. Anyone see anything from the DigiLocker yet? Hi, this is Emily. Um, so I haven't seen anything uh, in terms of direct access into DigiLocker. Uh, we've had applicants who access the documents and then forward it to us, but not in terms of uh, direct access on our end. Um, DigiLocker is supposedly taking over for uh, documents in India in terms of the National Academic Depository. But the truth of the matter is, uh, is that uh, we're still seeing um, electronic transcripts come through uh, provide third party providers such as True Copy and, and worldwide transcripts, if you will. Um, I did reach out to DigiLocker and I did receive a response that uh, currently it's only available for users in India, but I, I don't know if they misunderstood my question and they meant students <laughs> uh, located within India versus outside of India. So I, I did try to follow up and clarify. I haven't received a response. Um, if anyone uh, either on the panel or within the audience has more information to offer, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, but uh, in relation to that, I also want to add that um, TICEP, uh, which is a professional organization for uh, international credential evaluation professionals and, and is often a collaborator with ACRO, um, they are hosting um, a digital docs provider fair in March. So you have uh, groups like Digitary, uh, Worldwide Transcripts and True Copy that I mentioned from India who will be presenting at the fair. So they'll give uh, live demos on how to access their electronic platforms. Um, they'll answer your questions about security um, and of online verification capabilities. And there will be a, a chance for, for direct Q&A. So if you're uh, interested in that, and this will be for electronic uh, student record providers from around the world, um, the registration site will be available shortly in February uh, in, a, in a couple weeks time. So do watch out for that space on the TICEP website. Um, what I'll do is I'll put that information in the chat. That sounds great, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, here is another question. Um, and I think I will direct this one at Drew. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Martha and Peggy's recent webinars through ACRO on online verification tools from all corners of the world. Will ACRO add sections on the country profile when available, specifically to show users uh, where to verify their credentials online? Hey, Melanie, thanks for passing that over. Um, that is absolutely something that would be a valuable resource to add into Edge. And yes, we 100% will. Uh, one of the things that we really do want to encourage are best practices and going to those primary sources for that information is a great, uh, is an example of, of such a practice. So that is something that, that will be included. Thanks, Drew. Um, here's another question. When evaluating UK A-levels, do the subjects differ much between examination boards? In other words, is a math A-level basically the same, regardless of whether the student took the Cambridge, International, CIE, or the University of London, Excel, Pearson, et cetera? Anyone want to talk about exam boards and standardized curriculum in the UK? Hi, this is Emma again. So um, yeah, there, there are a handful of exam boards that offer uh, A-level subjects. And although the syllabi might uh, slightly differ in terms of the level of the knowledge and the content, they're supposed to represent the same level. And the, um, there is a coordinating body that looks at all this, um, a, 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 an external coordinating body outside of the exam boards that looks at all this. So uh, they can be regarded as being the, the same level. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate it. And I will just say that uh, this is something that uh, ACRO is getting ready to in the next month-ish uh, to release a new set of online self-paced courses. And one of the courses that we are talking about are um, external uh, courses uh, or, or uh, systems that uh, work with external exam boards. And that is absolutely one of them. 
and that is one of the uh, one of the things that make systems that use external exam boards a little bit easier in that the, the curriculum is standardized and in general you're not going to see a whole lot of difference they're really looking at base level competencies as opposed to um, highly different curriculum and i think we have time for one more question um, we do have to end right on time today and I do have, an, and maybe this is a good one to, to, to end on, um, I do have a question about um, vocational qualifications. And I'm not going to read the whole question um, because it's quite lengthy, but I'd like to get a sense from some of our colleagues on the call about your thoughts about vocational qualifications and how and how when we might start to think about adding those into EDGE. Um, specifically, this user is asking about German vocational qualifications, but I know it's, it's, a, it's a challenge that we talk about quite a lot. And I wonder if any of my colleagues on the IESC would like to comment on the vocational qualification question. Sure, Melanie, I'll, I'll start. And if somebody else wants to jump in, but real quick, um, as far as Germany's concerned, um, those, I guess I thought they were going to be in there, but I'll be glad to go back and look and see because this is, because they are a, a, an integral part of the German educational system. It's called a dual system um, where you segue over from ninth or 10th grade and you go into the uh, Berufsschule and so forth. So we really need to have those in there. To the question generally, um, it can kind of depend. And what's important to us is when those um, vocational credentials definitely segue or crosswalk with the academic portion and are just simply uh, a technical form of the same level of academic education, then we wanna be sure that those are included in there. What we don't want to include, at least for the moment, would be those that are professional training, um, which, um, which tend to be purely for um, professional development for a job and so forth and have no academic standing. They're not done under academic auspices. They're not controlled by Ministry of Education and others. This is where we might be more worried about a non-education ministry being in charge, such as one for skills training and development. Because it, it's nothing wrong. I mean, it's still the ministry. But what's important here is, is what kind of training is it and what is it meant to do in country? That's kind of the, the, my sort of overall take on it. And I'll turn it over to others. Hi, this is Emily. Yeah, with regard to the, the question specific to Germany's um, example, uh, the, the difficulty is when you do reach a vocational qualifications that go into the um, post-secondary or tertiary level, but they're still on the vocational track, if you will. And I know there can be disappointment if, if credit isn't recommended, uh, academic credit specifically. And, and that's because we look at how it's oriented and regarded in the country of study. And when there's a clear distinction made, um, it's not regarded as a university level credential, for example, it wouldn't be given transfer credit or access into graduate school in Germany, then we simply wouldn't recommend academic credit for those. Um, and that, that this includes those credentials that come from the, the crafts guilds, the, the chambers of commerce and such. Thank you so much, Emily. And I think we're gonna end the questions right now because I have a couple of more announcements I'd like to share and we, we'd like to end uh, right on time. So um, I want to call your attention to the Gloria Nathanson Research Fund for International Education. Um, if you are someone who is interested in um, embarking on an international education research project, uh, we do have these research grant awards of up to $1,000 that can help support um, research expenses, whether that's travel, materials, or any other direct costs. Um, the kinds of projects that we have funded in the past are, are uh, updates to edge profiles, substan substantive country updates, white papers on subjects of interest, or anything else that you might pitch that is in within this circle. And so be creative 
Um, if you are interested, if you have a project you'd like to pitch, I hope that you will go online uh, to acro.org and look for the Nathanson Research Fund and apply. Additionally, um, the IESC Fellowship Program, which uh, uh, Jasmine talked a little bit about at the beginning of the session, is now open for new fellows. The submission deadline is February 22nd. Um, we will make the appointment by March 15th, and that appointment will start at our annual meeting, March 28th to 31st. The length of the fellowship is approximately 18 months. Um, and you get when this fellowship program is does not cost anything to participate in and you get the mentorship of the IESC. You work on a research project with a research partner um, and get to publish that research, do presentations and really take part in the kind of in depth research and, and conversation that happens at the IESC. So we hope that uh, those of you who might be newer to the field would apply. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. And with that, I think we will uh, end right at three o'clock. Thank you for your time and we'll see you next month.